Hello everyone, and welcome to our Biology 1020 lecture series, Overpopulations. So this lecture is going to talk about uh, animals um, and how we look at animals and what is a population of animals, what's a population of humans, um, some of the things in nature that influence populations, um, how scientists look at populations, how we uh, gather data about populations, how healthy they are, um, and some other things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. So if you recall from Biology 1010, um, the biological levels of organization, um, right here you see the organism, population, community, ecosystem, biosphere thing. Um, and somebody that studies this stuff is called an ecologist, and this is the kind of the little simple breakdown of the study of ecology. Um, you have ecologists that study um, inner organisms, you have studied organisms, uh, uh, study populations, ecologists that study communities, um, ecologists that study the ecosystems, and so on and so forth. Well, all of these different levels of uh, biological organization, uh, organization are interconnected with one another. Um, all the organisms in, uh, make up a population, populations make up communities, um, and so on and so forth. So whatever happens at the lower levels impacts the big ones, and whatever happens at the big levels um, interact and influence the lower ones. So all of these different levels of organization um, influence one another. Now we'll talk about the rest of these later on, um, but let's go ahead and start with populations. So population, um, other than looking at an individual tree, um, which is not going to give you a lot of data, um, it's going to let you know a lot of stuff about one tree. Now that tree does not represent the average at all, it's just one. Um, so how are you going to know what the average lifespan of acacia trees are, or the average height, or the average color, um, average environment, and things like that? Um, or how, I mean, you might only pick one tree, and that one tree lives in a, a perfect environment, but they could probably live in horrible environments, or very different environments than the one that your, uh, your tree is growing in, but you would never know that um, if you looked at just one tree. So, um, a population of trees allows you to get a lot more information um, about the trees in an area. So what is a population? Well, a population of trees is all of these same trees of the same species that all live together that can interact and interbreed with one another um, in the same area at the same time. And that's the key there. Um, so take like a football field. Um, if you had a trees in there, all the trees that live inside of that football field, um, they're all there at the exact same time in the same location. They all have access to one another and they can all, in theory, interact and interbreed. And that is a population of animals. So the next level up is a community, and a community is going to take all of the different populations in an area, so all of the trees living in the football field of the same species, all the grass in the football field size area, all the uh, little mammal species that are there, all the individual ones of them, um, all the beetle individual ones of them, all the little bugs, all the birds, and things like that, all of the different living organisms um, inside of that football field sized area um, are going to make up the communities. Now in a population, you're talking about animals that interact with their own species. Um, and that happens all the time. Species interact with their own species. You have to uh, find mates. You have to uh, defend yourself from your territory, compete for food and things like that um, with your own species. Now a community, um, you also have to interact with other animals. Um, so you might be a possum, um, but you're more than likely going to run into a raccoon, a cat, and a dog um, on the front porch of the house that you come into. Um, at night to feed. So you're going to have to interact with different communities and different populations of animals. So a community is going to look at all of those different interactions of living organisms. Um, so how does the grass influence, in this example, the elephants? How do the trees influence the elephants? Well, the grass influence um, the elephants feeding, obviously, but the elephants will also trample the grass as they walk. Um, so they can influence each other. All of these things are interconnected and they influence each other. Um, so you're this, at this level of organization, um, you're taking into account all of the living organisms and how they all interact with one another. Well, the next level up uh, is going to look at an ecosystem where you take all of the living organisms, all of the communities, and when you also group them together with all of the non-living organisms. Um, and this is going to include, uh, or non-living things, I should say, not, not non-living organisms, non-living things. Um, and this is going to include things like uh, how much rainfall, the uh, soil, the, the grass, the nutrients in the soil, or sorry, the nutrients in the grass, available in the grass, the type of rocks, um, the temperature, how much sunlight this area gets, how much wind. 
um, because all of those different environmental factors, they're called abiotic or non-living. The living is biotic. All of the living things um, in an ecosystem includes the biotic and the non-living, the abiotic make up our ecosystem. Well, all those non-living factors, how much water is available, the nutrients in the grass, how much rain, how much sunlight, and all of that stuff is also going to have an influence on all of the animal communities in that area, um, as well as all the grass and plants and bugs and things, their communities as well. If there's not enough rain to sustain the grass, um, there's not going to be enough uh, grass to sustain the bugs, there's not going to be enough grass to sustain the large animals, the smaller animals, um, and things like that, so the whole population will collapse, the whole community will fall apart, and then the entire ecosystem will start to collapse as well. So ecosystems are very, very important. Once again, you can see how they all build up on top of one another. Well, if you take all of the ecosystems, all of the communities, all of the populations of all the organisms on the planet, you get the biosphere. And this is a global ecosystem. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that all of the ecosystems on the planet would interact with one another. Um, what happens in the savanna um, is going to influence what happens here. Um, if you think about that, um, you've had the, the trade winds have blown over here from the savanna, um, and they've brought the sand with them. Um, so all of those different things that happen within the Arctic, with the, with the warming of the Arctic, uh, raise global temperatures, um, raise global sea levels, all of those things can influence what happens on the rest of the globe, which in turn, as the rest of the environment start to change, will change the rest of the globe as well. So it's just a compounding cycle that all influences one another, which in turn is going to have downward effects, which can influence negatively the organisms, the, the populations, the communities, and the ecosystems as well. So let's talk about how ecologists look at populations, how we describe populations, and all of the things that are involved um, with studying populations. Well, the first thing you want to find when you look at a population is what their habitat is. Where do those organisms normally live? Um, where are they going to be found? Um, what's its normal environment? So if you would, uh, were to go to an area, you would not be, oh, that's something strange there. That's, that tree is supposed to be in the desert, for example. Um, so first you're going to want to define what your habitat is. And the next thing you're going to want to do um, is figure out what the habitat population density of an area is. You're going to want to figure out how close together, how far apart, how well dispersed these organisms are in their environment. Um, that's going to influence a lot of things. Are there a lot of organisms all grouped together? A lot of organisms all spread out? Not a lot of organisms? Do they move in a big giant clump? Um, and things like that. All of those factors matter. So what you'll see here um, are organisms um, like these uh, penguins that are have a very high population density. Um, they're going to be very packed closely together. There's a lot of them in a very, very, very small area. In fact, you can even see they're stacked up here on the cliffs of this little uh, uh, island. They're all the way down. They're all about three to four feet apart. They can barely stick their wings out. Um, so all of this is going to be considered a very high density um, population. There's a lot of organisms per area. Now when this is there, it takes a lot of resources, it puts a lot of strain on the environment. Now on the other hand, you have a low density population density um, over here. So these little tree palm trees, they're clumped together, um, but you can see they're spread quite far apart um, in the desert. Um, there's not as much water here, um, so if there were a bunch of trees growing together in one spot, um, it would suck up all the moisture from the environment, um, and then all of the trees would die. Um, so this is probably the very maximum um, that this little water spot can support. Um, anything more than that, they would probably all die. Now population can density can change. Um, organisms can move around in their environment if you're able to do so. Obviously these penguins can move, and these trees cannot, um, but their seeds can. Um, so as more organisms are brought into the population or organisms leave the population, um, that can influence the density as well. More organisms come in, it's going to get denser. More organisms leave, it's going to get a little uh, less dense. So, and also as the habitat changes, um, can have a great impact on the population density as well. Um, if you start out in the desert, um, and it slowly becomes a little more moist, a little more temperate, a little more grasslands over time, um, the previous uh, um, 
desert dwelling trees and desert dwelling animals um, are obviously going to have a less dense population over time as they um, as their habitat changes um, and they're no longer particularly well suited to live there anymore. Now how do you study population size and density over time? Well there are lots of ways to do this. Um, you can take aerial photos, you can fly over an area um, and take big pictures. Um, now this would allow you to tell if there's a lot of organisms in an area um, or a little uh, bit of organisms, are they dispersed equally? You can count them from the air in the photos like this. You could see all the penguins. Um, are they dispersed far apart like these uh, palm trees here? Um, are they clumped together like a big herd of elephants walking around the savanna? Um, and things like that. Now what you can also do um, is you can do a sample of a small subset where you can walk into a population. Um, you can watch a bunch of them for a little while in an area and see what they do. How do they move around? And what you can do is you can make an estimate based on the small subset that you watched um, what the larger population as a whole will do. Um, and then you can simply catch the organisms, um, put a mark on them of some sort, a band, a, a telemetry tag, or something like that. Um, that allows you to identify the organisms, write down when you caught it and where you caught it, and let them go again. And then months later, years later, whatever you choose, you come back and you catch organisms. Um, and if you catch one of the other organisms that was previously captured, um, you know that that organism has moved around or if it stayed in the same area, um, where it goes. Um, so that's a very uh, effective way to uh, track around animals and figure out where they move around and how they move. Um, by capturing them and then uh, and trying to capture them again later. Now, why do we need to estimate population size? So why do we need to know how many animals are out there, how far apart they are, how dispersed they are, um, and things like that? Well, there's a lot of reasons to do this. Um, so, um, when we have animals that are endangered, um, we obviously want to know that what their populations are like. Um, so if we have a very few rhino populations, uh, we line a lot of rhinos in a national park, they're being poached. Um, we definitely want to be able to keep track of where, they're, where, they're, where they are, how many there are, um, how healthy they are, um, are they interacting and things like that. So um, as the population gains more organisms, uh, we can monitor that. We can keep them safe to allow them to grow. Um, because if the population is being threatened by like, habitat loss, um, or poaching and things like that, um, we can monitor it and make sure that it was allowed to uh, recover and allowed to grow. Uh, now, the other reasons um, is sometimes you have pests that come into areas and you don't want them to stay there forever, um, or you don't want their population levels to get too high. Um, say like koalas here, they come into eucalyptus forest, and um, everybody thinks koalas are cute and cuddly, but they will strip a eucalyptus forest bare, they can sometimes kill them. Um, so areas in Australia can only support certain uh, amounts of koalas or else too many koalas will kill all the trees um, and then all the trees will die and then all the koalas will die. Neither one of those are good. Um, so what happens is the scientists will monitor the populations of koalas um, in that area. They make sure that there's not too many of them. I mean, if there are too many koalas in a certain area, um, too many babies are born each year, um, they will go in and capture them and move them to an area um, that has not enough koalas um, and release them there so they can rebuild a population of healthy koalas in a different area. Now all of this data um, can be used to manipulate population size. Um, like I said, if you want to protect an animal, you can cause its population to grow. Um, if you don't want the population to grow, um, as in our population of koalas here, you remove organisms, but you don't remove too many. Um, you make sure that you remove two or three while two or three are born every year kind of thing. Um, so they don't grow. The same amount of organisms are there um, the entire time that the environment can support. And if you want a population to shrink, um, what you do is you would go in, there's three koalas born each year, you would go in and take seven adult koalas away. Um, so that way um, it shrinks every year. Um, there's less and less koalas to reproduce with, um, and eventually the population will eventually decline. Um, and hopefully go away if that's your end game. Um, so there are lots of reasons um, to control population size. Um, if you hunt, um, you are aware of tags for animals and deer and things like that. Um, and that's to ensure that too many deer aren't killed every year or that the right number are killed um, so we don't lose deer 
you know, at one point in time in the state of Tennessee, there were about 35 turkeys, and they actually had to be imported in from Virginia um, to reintroduce the population of birds here because people had hunted them almost to extinction. Um, so through controlling population size and controlling how many organisms are killed and removed and added each year, um, you can grow and shrink animal population sizes through a human manipulation. So um, lots of other things that aren't necessarily within our control um, influence population size in animals too, and a lot of these just make sense. Um, births. If organisms are born, obviously they're going to have a new organism added to that population. Um, a new baby counts as a new life, um, and if his, both of his parents are still alive, um, you're going to have a plus one to the environment. Um, so that's a new organism adding to the population size as a whole. Um, you can see here, um, lots of different things affect the birth rates of populations. Um, how many times does an organism reproduce per year? How long is the gestation period if uh, an organism can uh, have a batch of babies every month, like a mouse? Or if you have to wait every 9 to 10 months, like a human? Um, so obviously if you can reproduce quite quickly, um, like a mouse, you're going to have uh, way more population growth um, than things like a human. How many babies do you have at a time? Once again, that matters. If you have one like us, um, that's one or two at a time for the, uh, most people, um, your population is going to grow quite slowly, especially if you only have them once a year. Now, if you're something like a mouse that can have 20 or 30 babies at the same time, and they can have that every month, they're going to have a very rapidly growing population. When do they start reproducing? In humans, it's uh, potentially around age 13, 14, whenever the first menstruation happens. Um, and in uh, mice, it's around a month or two old. Um, so they can reproduce very, very quickly. Um, in things like elephants, it takes a significantly longer time period to become sexually mature um, than uh, something like a mouse. Um, so if you're an elephant or a human, your population is going to grow way more slowly um, compared to organisms that uh, become sexually mature um, very early, like a, like a dog or a mouse or something like that. Um, another way is going to be the age structure of the population. Um, if there's a lot of young organisms, they tend to reproduce a lot more quickly um, than older organisms, which may not be able to reproduce at all. Um, organisms coming in to a population um, is going to be another way um, to help populations grow, and this one also makes sense as well. Um, organisms coming in um, is called immigration with an I. Um, so when they come into a population, obviously the population number is going to grow um, and going to go up. Well, there's going to be reasons why populations um, come in to previously existing populations, or they leave their old ones and go to a new one. Um, there's going to be uh, are lots of reasons that influence that as well. Um, how easy it is to get there. If it's quite easy to get to a different um, habitat, you're more than likely going to go there a little more uh, likely than if you have to fly across the Pacific Ocean instead of just walking across the street kind of thing if your populations are that close together. Um, also, if there's a lot of suitable habitat, um, you're less likely to leave. If there's a, not a lot of suitable habitat, um, you're more than likely to leave that population that you're in to try to go find another habitat and enter another one. Um, so that's another reason. If there's not a lot of places to live, um, organisms move around a lot um, to try to find a happy population and a happy place to live. Well, there are lots of things that can also detract and subtract um, from an organism's population as a whole. Um, and a lot of these just make sense. Death, um, an organism dies, um, it's no longer living, it can't reproduce, it can't contribute to that population as a whole. Um, so it can no longer be counted as the population grows um, or in the population at all. Now, deaths from accidents, um, you get hit by a car, you slip and fall, um, fall asleep while you're flying and you just crash into a building or crash into a building um, just on accident, anything like that. Um, animals have accidents too, just like humans. Um, that can take uh, an organism out of a population disease or some sort of genetic disease defect that um, they're just not healthy um, or they die from a, a, some sort of virus or bacterial infection and that happens quite often in nature. Um, they just get eaten and that's going to make sense. Um, something has to um, eat them to survive so they get eaten. Pretty easy. They're all going to be removed. Um, and then if there's just not enough food to go around, if it's a drought, 
um, there's not enough food for uh, not enough water um, organisms are just unfortunately going to starve or if there's a very high population density of organisms this can also influence that um, there's so many of them there that they ate all the food um, and there just wasn't enough food to there to start with um, so the organisms that unfortunately didn't get enough food they ran out of food and they're gonna starve too so high population densities can also influence that quite a lot of things can influence um, death rates and then organisms leaving populations how easy is it is, is it to leave the population and is going to influence that one as well um, if all I have to do is walk across the street to get away from the uh, um, bad environment that I'm in um, I'm going to more than likely do that um, whereas if I have to fly across the Pacific Ocean to get to the uh, a better environment um, I'm probably not going to give that a chance um, so that's how that works now, population's age structure um, can help determine how quickly a population can grow. Um, so if you uh, are an ecologist, you can figure out how old the uh, organisms are that you study um, and when they reproduce, and you can figure out how likely you are to have a fast-growing or a slow-growing population. Sorry, let me go back. Um, so if you have a population of trees, um, and they have a lot of of very young organisms in that population, um, you're probably going to have a very high birth rate. Um, young trees are um, re reproductively active. Um, young organisms are reproductively active. They're healthy. They're less likely to um, have accidents and genetic diseases and things like that inf uh, impact them. Um, they're in their prime of life. They are um, going to be reproducing um, like rabbits, as they say. So that population is going to be growing quite quickly. Um, in 5 or 10, 300 years, you will see a very high number of young organisms, young trees um, in this one, as all their seeds are uh, put out. Young organisms, young trees reproduce and make lots and lots of babies very quickly. So very high growth um, for a population, but a population that has a very um, high number of young organisms to begin with. <clears throat> Now, if you have mainly older individuals in your population, um, if you don't live very long to start with, you can see that over here, um, the vast majority of the trees are in their age 50. Um, they don't seem to live much past 70. So 50-year-old trees are very, very old in this example. Um, they're probably not reproducing. They've, uh, they're past the prime of their lives. Um, if they are reproducing, they're probably not reproducing well or as often as a young tree. Um, and what older organisms, in the sense of biology, tend to do um, is they're not reproductively active. So they're not putting things back into the population. Um, they're not replacing themselves. However, what they are doing is they are taking away uh, nutrients and space um, and mates and things, potentially, from younger organisms, which have the capability to reproduce more often um, and, and more successfully. So these older trees um, essentially just occupy space and they don't put anything back into the population. Um, so as they uh, don't reproduce, um, the older trees just sit there, the younger trees have their nutrients taken away, um, there's not a lot of reproduction going on with them. Um, so as these trees die off, um, their numbers are not replaced. Um, so young organisms are very, very important for populations to grow. Um, and if a population stops reproducing for a while for whatever reason, um, say a natural disaster or drought or something caused these populations of trees to stop, re this one right here, to stop reproducing for 10 to 15 years, 20 years, and then this is with the result, uh, they're going to have a very hard time recovering from something like that. Um, a wildfire or something will cause that. Um, that one over here, um, young. Re this is what a healthy population of, of organisms and trees should normally look like. Um, a very high population of young that's reproductively active to repro reproduce um, and keep the population healthy and growing. Um, and this is usually caused by some sort of um, different um, environment, uh, an environmental cause or something like that. So you can see something here called a life table. And a life table is going to be used to predict how likely organisms are um, to survive to a certain age. And this is how people um, get their life insurance uh, quote, quotes uh, and a premiums calculated for them. Um, so what happens is they, uh, now you can see this one was done with penguins. 
um, they take 1,000 penguins. Uh, they started with 1,000 penguins that are living. Um, the researchers watched all of these penguins. They tagged them. Um, and then what they did was they watched them for their entire life. Now, penguins only live to be about age 17 or 20, um, at the very most, this particular species. Now, what happens um, is what they did, you can see over here, this is the number version, it's a little easier to understand than the graph. Um, at age zero, when they're born, they started with 1,000 penguins. At age one, there were 324 of them that were still alive. That's a pretty horrid uh, chance of surviving to one year old. Most wild animals have a very high um, death rate when they're young due to their inability to survive. They just don't know how to survive. They're accident prone. Um, young organisms are very easy to catch and eat from predators. Um, it's very hard for them to know how to hunt and fish properly, so they just starve to death um, or they get eaten. Um, they have accidents all the time. So this is pretty standard for most wild animals. Now, um, what they do is they continue to watch them for the rest of their life. At age one, at age two, at age three, they just take account um, of how many penguins are still alive um, until all of the penguins are dead from natural causes. Um, now what this does is it gives you a really nice uh, chance. You can do some percentages here, 225, 1,000 divided by 3.4, blah, blah, blah. Um, get some math here and figure out what the chances of a penguin to surviving to age one is, to age two, to age three, to age four. What is the likelihood um, of an organism surviving to a certain age? Now this will tell you how um, likely it is for a, an organism um, to reproduce, how quickly populations can grow, um, and things like this. Now you can see um, at about age 11 down here, 98 to age 12, 87 penguins, you have about a 10% survival rate, about a 10% chance um, of making it um, from birth to age 12 as a penguin. Um, so the penguins that make it to that age um, are very strong. And then you can see at that point in time, um, they really start to have a drastic decline. And this is just from decline of age. Um, they start to get slower since it's pretty stable here um, from uh, once a time. So once how this kind of works is if you make it to a certain point, you're more than likely going to survive to the next point. And if you make it there, you're more than likely going to survive to the next point. But it's really hard for wild animals just to get to the very first point to begin with. That's just so difficult for them. Um, so animals have a very rough time with that. So um, this thing here is the curve version of this. Um, so and you can see here most penguins die right here. This is the age of reproduction, one, two, three, at age three. Um, and most penguins will die even before they reach that. So it's very important uh, to keep that in mind um, if you're trying to study the growth or decline of the penguin population. Um, the vast majority of them will die. So if you want this penguin population to grow, what you would need to do is catch most of the penguins when they're babies or hatch a bunch of eggs for them um, and keep them in a zoo uh, or help them out in some way, shape, or form to about age three or four. And then you can release them. Give them that boost they need to get over that hump where they're going to more than likely survive um, in the wild, whereas they would more than likely die to begin with. Um, so this is a very useful thing to know um, if you want to influence population growth um, or cause a population of animals to die if you need to uh, remove a lot of young organisms or a lot of older organisms. Very, very useful thing. Um, so something like this has been crafted for humans. Um, this is how pe life insurance um, companies figure out premiums. Um, they go, how likely are humans to live to be age 60? Well, most people live to be age 60, so most people don't live to be 70, most people don't live to be 80, most people don't live to be 90, so the higher up you get, um, the more you're going to be charged for your insurance because you have a less likely chance of getting there. So if you get there, um, you're going to have more than likely have health problems and things like that that's going to cost them more, um, so you have more to pay in your premiums. That's how that works. So um, once you get all this information, you can uh, create something called a survivorship curve. And this is what this is right here, survivorship curve. And there's three different types of curves that you can create for animals, a type one, a type two, and a type three. Um, so animals fall into one of these type categories. So a type one organism um, is going to have a very high likelihood um, of reaching adulthood. Uh, most organisms are going to a, survive um, to the age of reproduction most organisms are going to reproduce 
Um, and most organisms, after they reproduce, will survive for a fairly long time and be able to reproduce, and then they will start to decline and die um, due to natural causes. Now, the reason for this um, is elephants and humans and whales and organisms that are all considered type 1, um, uh, eight, great apes and things, um, we invest a lot of time in our young. Um, we make sure that our babies are cared for, um, up until age 20 or 30 or 40 for some of the uh, humans. Um, elephants and whales and things keep their babies around for decades, um, sometimes their whole life. Um, and they will help them um, and help ensure that their babies survive um, to the age of adulthood. Now, these organisms live a long time. They don't, they mature very slowly, so it takes 10 to 15 years for these organisms to become sexually mature. Um, so it's very important that you survive 15, 20 years so you can begin reproducing. Um, so our species, elephants and things like that, we want to ensure our babies have the best chance of being able to survive to reproduce. So we put a lot of time and effort um, in protecting them and making sure that they get there. Um, so once they get there, they're usually pretty good to handle things on their own um, or they continue to hang around the group. Um, they will survive and reproduce up until old age takes them for the most part. And that's a type 1 organism. Now, a type 2 organism, the vast majority of wild animals, birds, and things like that, um, they have a pretty decent likelihood of pretty much dying all throughout their entire life. They're born, they could freeze to death, they could get squished by their mother, they could fall out of the nest, a predator could eat them, a snake or something like that. Um, a gopher baby that are born in a hole, a fox could get them, a snake could get them, they could die from freezing, starving, things like that. Um, there's a pretty decent likelihood that those organisms are going to die um, and have the same ch uh, chances of dying and the same challenges all throughout their entire life. Each day a cardinal wakes up regardless of if it is a baby or if it is an adult or an older organism. Um, it's going to have to worry about finding enough food finding enough water, finding enough shelter. Whereas elephants um, and us, if a baby wakes up and he's totally helpless, um, he doesn't have to worry about finding food because his mom will provide it for him. Um, now if his, this guy wakes up as a baby and his mom can't provide enough food for him, um, a predator could eat him, um, he could freeze to death. Whereas over here, the mom's predators, or, or the mom's going to protect from predators, um, and things like that, and give them more freedom. So a lot more challenges for these types of organisms. They tend to not really have um, much, if any, parental care. Maybe the parents take care of them for a couple of months at the most, um, just to make sure that they're uh, not going to die while they're baby babies. Um, and then once the, uh, uh, they're old enough to leave the nest or leave the, d the den, um, the parents will pretty much go their separate way. Um, and they have a pretty decent likelihood of dying, um, freezing to death, getting hit by a car, getting eaten by a predator, starving to death, anything along the way. Um, and then you have type 3. Um, and this is often called the boom or bust life cycles. Um, and this is a lot of things like uh, uh, bugs, fish, plants, uh, sea turtles, unfortunately, do this one as well. Um, this is the boom or bust where they have billions of eggs. Um, the mom will climb, mom, mother sea turtle will climb onto the beach. They have a big giant nest of a couple hundred eggs. She swims away back out into the ocean and she never sees her babies again. Um, they all hatch to make a mad d dash for the ocean to try to get there. Um, 50, 60, 70, 100 of them are going to be eaten by um, seagulls and other birds and things along the way, crabs. Um, the vast majority of them are going to be eaten by fish and things along the way to the ocean um, once they make it. Um, and maybe 7 of the 100,000, or the, the 100 or 200, 300 eggs that she laid, uh, maybe 7 of those babies will make it to adulthood. Um, the uh, parents invest very little time, very little energy, but they have so many babies um, that it doesn't really matter. If you have 15,000 babies as a fly um, and only 50 of them survive to adulthood, it doesn't really matter. Um, millions die, the vast majority of them are not going to make it, but you have enough to replace yourself and that's all that really matters. Um, so that's how the vast majority of organisms work on the planet. Plants the same way, they can't know where their seeds are going to go, so the vast majority of seeds just land somewhere that's totally inhospitable for life. Um, so they have so many plants and seeds and things that eventually one of them will land somewhere that's useful um, and they grow. So that's that's a type three, uh, the boom or bust life cycle. <clears throat> so the way that organisms um, care for their babies and things, something called a life history, 
um, is going to inf vary um, how an organism lives its life when it starts to reproduce. Um, all of the uh, adaptations that make organisms successful in their life, um, is you can study as an ecologist um, and put that together as something called an organism's uh, life history. And this is pretty much everything that happens to an organism from point A of its life um, through point uh, Z of its death. I and mean, this is going to pretty much allow you to watch everything that an organism does when they start to reproduce and figure out <clears throat> how successful organisms are at reproducing um, and what, if any, adaptations that this particular organism has that makes it any more... Uh, any more or any less um, reproductively successful? Is this organism more likely to find a mate um, or not? Um, and you can find that out by studying what they do throughout their life. Now, reproduction um, is a very, very costly thing. And it's, a, it's very important to note um, that if you're going to reproduce as a wild animal, you know, even as a human for the most part, um, you're going to have to just realize that you're going to be investing a lot of time a lot of care, a lot of energy um, into protecting these little babies right here. Not just yourself anymore. You have to protect these guys. And these guys are pretty much giant, um, error-prone puppies that run around and trip over everything, don't really know how to stand um, uh, out, or don't really know how to camouflage, don't really know how to do anything for themselves. So this mother bear um, she's going to have to not only defend herself, defend these little guys from other bears, um, other wolves and things like that in the environment. She's going to have to find food for herself and her babies now, keep them safe, keep them warm. And that's quite a challenge when you live in the environment that's uh, as challenging as these guys live in to begin with. There's not a lot of food to start with, so when you got to provide for two extra mouths, that's a big deal. So when you decide to reproduce, or when an organism has evolved to reproduce, I should say, um, th it's very important um, that they get the timing right. Um, if you reproduce too early in the year, um, it can really ca uh, cause some problems. Maybe there's not enough food yet, um, so your babies are going to starve to death. Um, if you reproduce too late in the year, the food's already gone, so you don't have enough food to feed them to get them over the winter. Um, so you got to get it really right, right in the late spring for a bear um, to be able to uh, feed your babies properly and make sure that they have enough food um, available for them. You have to time that reproduction properly. Um, if the uh, animal doesn't get it right, if they mate in the wrong time, if they're not um, um, during uh, or in, you're in, in estus, estrus at the, same, at the right time, um, they won't be able to mate. Um, so all of that stuff really matters for populations. So there's something called um, two different types of reproductive strategies when it comes to animals and when they decide and when they and how they have babies. Um, and this is that boom or bust life cycle I just mentioned. Um, they're opportunistic. This is how that type three organisms work. Um, and then there's e um, equilibrium, which is type one. And then I'll get into these in just a little bit more in a second. So a, a quantity type reproduction system or an opportunity Genistic or boom or bust life cycle um, is essentially we have millions of babies. The vast majority of them will not make it to adulthood, um, and the ones that do are going to have enough babies to re uh, to be able to repopulate the entire um, species as a whole. And that's just how they work. Um, that's kind of a sad fact of nature. These guys have a very high reproduction uh, rate. Flies become very reproductively active very, very quickly in their lives. They don't live very long. Um, so it's very important for them to become reproductively active very quickly when you die um, pretty much right after you're born. Um, they have millions of eggs. Um, so since the vast majority of them die, um, the ones that do survive, they want to make sure that they have millions of eggs that can reproduce the millions that will die um, from the <laughs> eggs to start with. Um, they live a couple of weeks at the most. They don't have enough time to provide uh, care for their offspring. Um, the second these guys lay their eggs, they're probably either going to die or have to go lay another batch of eggs which is uh, to ensure that their species survives. Um, so they have very little um, parental care in their offspring, if any at all. Um, they mostly just leave their eggs and they leave. Um, 
most of the time the babies are going to die. I've talked about that one. The vast majority of these eggs, if they hatch at all, will die before they even reach um, uh, reproductive maturity. They'll just die. Um, they're easy to catch. They're easy to find. They're easy to see. Um, they just don't survive. Uh, sometimes even bugs will cannibalize one another. Um, so their, their brothers and sisters eat them um, for food. So that's a really easy way to go, <laughs> go away from the population. Um, they reproduce very quickly. I mentioned that one. Um, and then that's that type 3 survivorship curve, that boom or bust life cycle. Um, make a bunch of babies. The vast majority of them are going to die, but you made so many of them that eventually some of them are going to make it to adulthood. Um, they're going to have a billion more babies. The vast majority of them are going to die, but some of them are going to make it, and that's how that works. And then the other one is the equilibrium life history. Um, and this is how we are. Um, we have very low reproductive rates. Um, we reproduce at the most, uh, at the maximum, about once per year you could have a child as a human, um, whereas uh, mice can reproduce once every couple of weeks and have 20 or 30 babies at a time. Um, humans tend to only have one to two offspring at the very most at a time, um, so we don't have a bunch of babies. Um, each one of our offspring, elephants and um, things like that, bears, we invest a lot of time into our babies. Um, we have to carry them around for two to three years at a time for elephants, um, nine months for a human. Um, so you want to make sure that that little baby that you spend all that time growing um, and carrying around is going to make it to adulthood because you put all that time and effort into um, raising it. You want to make sure um, that it, it's able to survive. Um, very high survival rate um, because the parents intervene. The parents help and take care of them, and that's the key there. Um, the parents are going to ensure um, that their babies reach reproductive maturity because that's the whole point of biology, the whole point of evolution, the whole point of life um, is to carry on your genes, to have babies to, so your species can continue. Um, these guys are going to have a very late reproductive maturity. Um, they reproduce later in life. They're not going to be sexually mature um, right out of the bat like a fly. The second it molts out of its final stages, flies are ready to reproduce after a couple of weeks after they're born at the very most. Um, and this is that type 1 um, survivorship curve. Um, this is the equilibrium life history. This is a very high quality offspring versus a bunch of high qu quantity offspring. You have a bunch of them and most of them are going to die, where over here we have one or two of them, and the ones that we do have are really good. Um, so we ensure that they survive to adulthood. So the quantity versus quality, um, equilibrium versus um, opportunistic, boom or bust versus stable. So most species on the planet um, are somewhere kind of in between. Um, so lots of animals on the planet um, are very easy to pick out. Um, the things like whales, you can figure out elephants, but the vast majority of organisms on the planet um, fall somewhere kind of in between. They have a bunch of babies, but not all of them are going to make it, um, so somewhere in between. Um, so once again, that life history concept, um, you can see over here is going to include all of the different things that an organism does throughout its entire life um, that influences how um, reproductively successful they are, mate selection, when they reproduce, how many babies they have, how often they have babies, if they get any, any parental care at all, um, and things like that. So um, all that information in that life history table helps you determine um, how likely a population is to grow or decline um, and help you make good decisions on how to manage a population of organisms. So all of this information um, can also help you figure out how populations grow. Um, now, I mentioned this one earlier with that population, the age structure. Um, now, you can see over here a lot of young organisms on the bottom. This is time down here, population size. Um, and this is a young population here, a lot of very young organisms. Down here at the bottom, not a lot of older organisms. Um, this population is going to grow quite quickly. Um, whereas over here, you can see it's very equally dispersed throughout the age structure. Um, pretty much a lot of uh, middle-aged people here a lot of young, um, but a lot of middle-aged, and not a lot of elderly people, but it's pretty much equally dispersed here. Um, so this is the age structure graph, age structure concept, how you read these. Um, the more at the bottom, the more young, the more in the middle, the more middle-aged uh, organisms, the more at the top, the more elderly populations. And this is male over here and female over here. And this is how you read these types of graphs. So population growth um, can be considered either exponential or logistic. 
So exponential growth occurs when a population is going to grow. Um, the population growth rate as well as the population size is going to increase. Um, so more animals are going to be added each year. And that's the, the key here for exponential growth. So they're going to grow not only the population size, but how quickly it's going to grow as well is going to increase. And that's a big deal. So you have organisms that are out there. The organisms that are out there are going to have more babies than the organisms that were there before them, which means you have more organisms to have even more babies, which causes the population to grow very quickly. And in some cases, that's a good thing. Now you can see over here, uh, population growth. Um, they took pictures. You can see how they tagged them. Um, complete tagging aerial photography and complete tagging. And you can see the number of seals, pups, um, that were tagged and counted each year. And you can see this population continued to grow up and up and up and up um, of seals here. It makes a very sharp J curve or the uh, amount of seal pups in the year that they were um, captured at. And so exponential growth um, is when a population grows very quickly um, over a time period. And this occurs for the most part um, when resources are unlimited. If an animal um, lives in a really great environment, so these seal pups, there weren't a lot of predators, there was a lot of food, they lived in a very great ocean environment and things like that, um, so they continued to have lots and lots and lots of babies. Now over here, um, this example uses something called a rotifer. Um, it's a little tiny uh, protist organism, a little small microscopic little uh, critter, um, filter feeder. And they're introduced into a population or a, um, um, a jar pretty much with food. And you put 50 indiv uh, one or two individuals in there. You can see that down here. Um, and over a couple of days, there were 50 new individuals. And very quickly, those 50 new individuals went to 357 and 966. Very fast. It grew very quickly. Um, exponential growth. Um, there's a, a lot of resources available, there's a lot of space available um, for these organisms to grow with. Now unfortunately, what's going to happen is eventually these organisms are going to have a problem. Exponential growth, unlimited growth, can occur when no predators are there, lots of food, a healthy environment, um, and things like that. So you have a really good environment for these organisms to grow in. Um, the um, bigger the population to start with, um, 349 is going to have a lot of babies, but 357 is going to have way more babies, and 966 is going to have way more babies than 357. So the more organisms that are in a population to start with, the more babies that they're going to have, which is going to cause this curve to just go skyrocketing straight forward um, after a couple more generations. It'll literally just be a big straight line just going straight up. Um, so every time these guys reproduce, there's way more babies to be added to the population. Now the problem with this is that eventually these organisms are going to reach something called the carrying capacity. Um, life on Earth and pretty much every environment um, cannot sustain unlimited animals, unlimited growth. Eventually what's going to happen um, is the organisms are going to start eating food more than the foods coming in. Um, so this is the same concept of a fish tank. If you don't put food in your fish tank, eventually the fish are going to starve. Um, if the food, food, food in the fish tank um, would last for five or six days, they would have five or six days worth of food, um, but eventually they would run out. And this is essentially what happens here. Food, resources, and things eventually run out in the environment um, at some point in time. Now when this occurs, is when there's so many organisms that they're eating food, they're occupying space, all organisms need enough food to survive and enough space to live in, that there's so many organisms that not everybody's getting enough to go around to make everybody healthy um, and sustain everybody's life. So there's there's uh, 15 slices of bread and 17 animals now. When there were 18, uh, when there were five animals and 15 slices of bread, it's really easy to reproduce really fast and really quick. But now that there's 20 animals and 15 slices of bread still uh, coming in every day, somebody's going to start to starve. Either they can all share, which causes everybody to starve, or they can just let five starve, and that's sometimes how that works, depending on the animal population. But eventually, once that starts, once that concept starts, 
the organisms have reached the carrying capacity of the environment. Once resources start to run out, once there's not enough food to go around and animals start to starve to death, they reach the carrying capacity of the environment. Um, and that's when populations start to die. Um, once they reach that, they start to reach logistical growth, um, where they start to slow down. Life just, uh, sorry, the, the growth rate starts to just even out um, and flatten out. And they will pretty much stay that way. The death rate's going to be equal to the growth rate, or the birth rate. Um, there's not enough food, not enough space to have more organisms. Um, and they just can't grow any more than that because if they did, um, everybody would start uh, having problems again. Um, organisms would start starving. They would not have enough food to go around. Um, so the environment um, limits how many animals and organisms can be there um, due to the carrying concept, that um, environmental feedback, that environmental pushback concept, um, where there's just not enough food in the environment for more organisms to survive. Now, if there are more organisms in the um, environment, everything's going to crash. Um, and eventually everything will come crashing down. They'll deplete all the food in the environment. Um, all the food in the environment will be de demolished. It'll go away. Um, they'll deplete everything. Um, it will have a very hard time building itself back up. And eventually all of the organisms will deplete the environment. And they will all starve to death. And this entire graph will just crash. Um, so that's how this one works. Now, population growth, for the most part, goes in cycles. Um, and this is going to make sense if you think about it. Um, you can see the green line here, collared lemmings, and then the uh, brown line here are stoats. Lemmings are kind of like little mice. Stoats are kind of like little uh, wild ferrets. Um, so the lemming population goes up, and the stoat population goes up with it. Stoats hunt lemmings. That's one of their primary prey items. Um, so the more lemmings there are, the more stoats there are going to be um, to hunt the lemmings. Now, unfortunately, what's going to happen is the more stoats there are, the less lemmings there are going to be, because eventually the stoats are going to um, have too many uh, stoats, and they're going to start catching the lemmings more than the lemmings can reproduce. So the lemming population is going to start to decline. And as the lemming population starts to decline, there's going to be less lemmings for the stoats to eat. Well, there's still a lot of stoats, and those stoats don't have enough food, so those stoats are going to start to starve to death which means their population is going to decline as well. Now, as the lemming population is still declining, as the remaining lots of stoats still eat them, they're going to, uh, the lemming population is going to decline and decline and decline again. And as the lemming population goes down, the lots of stoats that are still there are also going to have less food to go around, um, and they're going to start to starve to death as well. Until eventually what happens is they reach the bottom point down here, where there's one, uh, not enough stoats, and enough lemmings that the stoats can't catch the lemmings in time for them to reproduce anymore. So the lemmings now have time to start reproducing. So the lemmings will start to reproduce. There's not enough stoats to catch them anymore because the vast majority of them starve to death. So the lemming population starts to increase. Well, as the lemming population starts to increase, now the um, environment can support some more stoats. There's more lemmings to feed them. And the stoat population starts to increase again. And as the lemming population increases, the stoat population increases up until that certain point again where there's too many stoats and they're killing off the lemmings faster than they can reproduce and the whole thing crashes down again. And this is how the vast majority of animals um, throughout the environment work. Their populations go in these big cycles like this. Um, where there's a lot of them, um, especially if they're a predator or prey animal that's dependent on their, um, their predator-prey relationship. They go up in these down there. Uh, cycles a lot. Now lots of environmental conditions um, can influence how large or small populations can be. Um, and this is something that you probably don't think about uh, very often. And these are called limiting factors. Or de uh, so the first one that we're going to talk about is something called a density dependent factor. And this is something that's going to influence population of animals at a whole. Um, and the more animals there are in a population, or the less animals there are in a population, um, the more that's going to have an impact. So the higher the animals there are, um, more the higher the number of organisms there are in an area, the more likely um, this thing is going to impact them. So density-dependent factors are going to be things like um, competition for resources, um, diseases, 
predators, um, available space, available nutrients, food, um, and things like that. And this is going to make sense if you think about it. Um, if you live in a big group, if there's a bunch of you around, tons of you, um, density dependent, lots of you, high density, um, a predator comes in, and it's more than likely going to get this one and not you over here. Um, so living in a big high density for predators is a good thing. Um, well, if there's only three or four of you, and it's you, you, and you, this guy, and you're this one, and a lion comes in and there's only three of you to choose from, you have a one in three chance of getting eaten now. Um, so density dependent in that situation, a low density dependent, is a bad thing. So it really just depends on how you how, how the uh, number of organisms shake out at that area. Disease is another one to look at. If there's a high organisms, high population of organisms, disease is going to spread very easily in this population of deer here. Um, whereas if there's one or two organisms in that environment, um, they're going to have a, a very difficult time spreading between them. High population density um, is going to have a lot of organisms crammed into one area, competing for resources, competing for space, um, competing for mates. Um, so that's going to have um, an, an impact um, on their population as a whole. Now there are also density independent factors. And this is going to be things that are not living, things that don't happen because other animals are around or a, a disease is around or something like that. Um, these are going to be things like natural disasters, um, accidents, industrial accidents, um, habitat destruction, habitat loss, and things that animals, um, if there's one animal in an area or two animals in an area or 10 million animals in an area, it does not matter. Um, so you can see over here, this is a wildfire. Um, this is an abiotic event, a non-living event, and most of the time they are, um, these density independent factors. You can see over here there are two deer in this picture. Well, there could be 14 million deer in this picture, and this fire is going to kill them the same. This fire is going to burn these two deer, or this fire is going to burn 14 million deer the same. It does not matter. And if these deer run away, it couldn't, doesn't matter if there were two deer or 14 million deer here. When they all come back, their entire habitat is going to be destroyed. So it doesn't matter how many deer were there to start with, 1, 15 million, their entire habitat's going to be destroyed regardless. An earthquake, if there's one quail or 14 quail or 14 million quail nesting in an area, if an earthquake comes through, it's going to destroy the entire habitat. It does not matter how many of them are there. Um, if an oil spill happens in the Gulf of Mexico and it happens um, and there's one um, little sardine thing out there, um, one little sardine swimming around or the entire um, sardine uh, migrations coming through, one's going to die or 10, 10 million are going to die. It does not matter. Um, and these are non-living, uh, independ density-independent factors. It's going to have a, a horrible impact on the environment, regardless of the number of animals that are there. Um, so these things are never good things, for the most part, for the environment. Um, and when the habitat goes away, it's destroyed, um, they're going to have nat uh, impacts on the populations as a whole. So if there's one fish, or two fish, um, three deer, 18 million deer, Density independent factors, things like fire, lightning strikes, human destructions, um, is going to have an impact on them regardless. So the human population um, hit that nice little uh, carrying capacity and just went on through it um, quite a while ago. So there are quite a few reasons why this happens. Um, we have exponential growth. We are just growing out of control up into the 7, 8 billion, 9 billion, 10 billion, 20 billion um, range at one point in time. We will be skyrocketing up there. And we've pretty much been in exponential growth for the last 2,000 years of human existence. Um, we've been pretty much growing straight up, straight off the chart um, for a really, really, really long time. So we haven't really hit um, anything yet um, that limits our population, and why? Well, most of the um, reason why we're growing so fast is because a lot of the previously developed country, or undeveloped countries, are now becoming more developed. Um, so places that tended to not have um, high birth rates or, um, at one point in time are now starting to um, have a little bit of a reversal on that. 
Um, so, um, the, a lot of, uh, like in our, our country, um, people have one or two babies and they live for a really long time and they, they, they tend to live for a very long time as well. Um, but we don't have a, quite a lot of babies over here. Um, now in the rest of the world, in a lot of developing countries, um, they live for a very long time, but they have six, seven, eight, nine, ten children, lots and lots of more babies, um, than they have in the more developed countries throughout the, the, um, the globe. Um, now, as this occurs, this causes a very high population growth in those areas. Um, remember I talked about a lot of young organisms um, have a very high population growth, and that's what you see in these countries, um, which causes the populations um, in these areas to go very, very, very high. Um, so you can see down here um, a little bit of what changes um, throughout the populations of humans. Um, you can see the uh, death rate stabilizing over here. Um, so let's go over here. High, death, high birth rates and death rates um, keep populations small. And this is what essentially happens um, in the very beginning of human existence. We have a very high birth rate or very undeveloped countries and a high death rate. Um, you're, as a baby's born, a human baby's born, um, the mortality rate as an infant's going to be very high. The mother's probably going to be living in poverty or have a hard time finding enough food to start with. Um, they may be living in a subsistence farming community or something like that. Um, so the babies are more likely to die. And then um, the adults are going to have the same struggles, a very difficult time staying alive. And this is what you see um, early in human existence, um, early in, in civilizations rising in humans, um, in a lot of uh, really, really underdeveloped countries nowadays. Population growth will start to occur um, when the death rate uh, falls faster than the birth rates. Less people are dying um, that are being born. And then you start to see population growth. And this is what you start to see when countries become a little more developed. Um, they're able to kind of stabilize that infant mortality rate and keep uh, babies alive um, up until reproductive rates. And then you start to see population uh, start to grow. Um, and then in stage three of human growth, um, when the, the countries start to become a little more um, 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 economically stable, um, you start to see death rates start to decline um, and birth rates uh, start to decline as well. Um, and then the population stabilizes. And this is when um, people become burdened with jobs um, and things like that, that that prevent them from having um, families or, or delay um, families to a certain extent. Um, and then the population rate starts to stabilize off. So a lot of countries are still in this developing stage right here. Um, a lot of uh, more developed, more um, economic countries um, hit this stage quite a while ago, and we've been in a very slow, if any, population growth for quite a while. Um, so um, a lot of countries that once were racked with diseases, um, didn't have a lot of uh, um, high living um, standards, are now becoming uh, different. They're starting to get higher living standards. Um, improved disease control and things like that. So the death rate is starting to um, decline. Um, so, but now, but they still have a lot of babies. They still have a very high uh, birth rate. Um, so up until the point where the birth rate um, starts to stabilize off at the death rate, um, their populations will continue to grow. So that's one reason that the populations of humans are growing up. Um, countries that were less um, economically um, successful are now becoming more economically successful and their citizens are now um, having a little more social mobility, which is a good thing. Um, so you can see here, this is our age breakdown of countries, and you can see how quickly countries are growing. Um, so India, you can see down here, is a very high population of young organisms. Remember, once again, blue is male, pink is female. Um, you can see the sides over here, male and then female. Um, so the reproductive years, you can see down here how often we have babies and when. Um, so India as a country has quite a lot of young individuals, not a lot of um, older um, people. Um, so their population is expected to grow quite quickly. These younger organisms um, will reproduce um, a lot. There's a bunch of them that are going to start reproducing, which will cause tons of babies to be born. They'll probably have three and four babies each, which will cause their population to grow very, very fast. And this is what that population curve would look like. Over here in the United States, we've reached that um, stage three, our populations become a little more stable, um, so we don't really have a lot of growth in our population. We've kind of more leveled off. And you can see over here in China, we don't have a very high 
birth rate and they have a lot of um, older organ a lot of older people in their population um, so when this occurs these older people are uh, not reproducing um, which causes the population to decline over time because as more organisms uh, more people die than are being born the population um, declines as a whole so this is very useful um, to figure out how quick uh, populations of humans are going to grow across the globe um, death rate influences how quick populations grow, and this one makes perfect sense. Um, you can see down here a lot of uh, causes of deaths in high-income countries. Heart disease are horrible diets. Um, stroke probably caused by our horrible diets and things like that. Um, Alzheimer's disease, we live long enough to uh, have our brains start to de deteriorate. It could be also caused by environmental lung cancer, um, smoking, our diets and things like that. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease caused by smoking. Um, other than things in our environment. This is what's going to be killing people in high-income countries. Lower-income countries, you're going to have more natural things. Lower respiratory environments. They get pneumonia. Um, they get bronchitis just from having um, living in bad conditions where they inhale dust and things like that that we don't have. Diarrhea, some sort of um, disease like cholera where they're not able to retain fluids and they, um, they lose fluids and they die. Um, strokes, same, that's kind of natural, happens from everybody around the world. Heart disease, um, they have bad diets in certain countries, but not nearly as much. Um, and then HIV AIDS, that's a very, very bad thing um, throughout the world as well. Um, something that we don't have to deal with in high-income countries. So you can see the different struggles um, that other countries and other parts of the world go through um, and some of the leading causes of death for people in those areas. So one of the other things that humans do is we way over exploit um, the resources on the planet. Now you can see down here, um, we have the countries on the planet from the richest to the poorest. Um, so super rich countries down to the absolute poorest down in here. And you can see the um, countries, and this is what the average citizen um, falls in between. You can see the colors down here. Now what you can see also um, is how much of the environment down here is reflected that we actually use up, how much resources um, than we, that we would use, uh, that we do use, and that's scaled to the size of our country. So you can see the United States uses way more resources um, than we actually um, have. <laughs> so we use way more um, than we have. China uses way more. India uses way more. And a lot of these African countries have very little. Um, and you can see, you can kind of start to get a picture and understanding Japan uses so many because they're an island and they have so many people. Um, and you can start to get an understanding here of population density um, and what's going on with how populations grow um, and how we as humans influence life on Earth. And you can kind of start to understand that. Um, so this is pretty much all I've got for these PowerPoints, guys, over populations. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me an email. Um, if not, have a great rest of your day.